Acclaimed as the preeminent guitarist of our time, Sharon Isbin was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She began her guitar training with Aldo Minnelli in Varese, Italy. Ms. Isbin later studied with Jeffrey Van, Sophocles Papas, Andres Segovia, Oscar Giglia, Ali Rio Diaz, and for 10 years with the noted keyboard artist and box scholar Rosalind Turek. Isbin collaborated with Turek in preparing and recording landmark first performance editions of the Bach Lute Suites for guitar. Ms. Isbin received a BA cum laude from Yale University and a Master of Music from the Yale School of Music. Isbin has appeared as soloist with over 200 orchestras and has commissioned more concertos than any other guitarist. Her catalogue of over 35 recordings has sold nearly a million copies and ranges from Baroque, Spanish-slash-Latin and 20th century to crossover and jazz fusion. Isbin has received numerous prestigious international awards, including a Grammy in 2001. Please join our host, William Ford and guitarist, Sharon Isbin. Hi there, how are you, William? Nice to meet you. Hey, good to meet you too. Where are you? I'm in New York City, in my home. Glad that you could find a few minutes. I thought maybe we could start talking a bit about your way back background. I know that you started to take guitar lessons at nine in Italy. Yes. But what about before that? Did you have a particular direction toward music? How, how did that all come about? It's actually, I'm a guitarist by default. So when I was very young, I uh, must have been about six years old, like all the kids in our family, we started piano lessons with my aunt. And I gave that up by the right, ripe old age of eight. And when we moved to Italy, my father, being a scientist, was invited to take his sabbatical year from the University of Minnesota in Varese, which is near Milano. We all went along and my older brother said he wanted guitar lessons. His fantasy was to be the next Elvis Presley. So my parents didn't know that and actually were thrilled to discover that a former student of Andre Segovia, who was now at that time a concertizing throughout Italy, happened to be teaching at the local music school, commuting in from Milan, Aldo Minella. So they took my brother for the interview. As soon as he realized it was classical, he said, no way, not for me. And my parents by that point were convinced somebody in the family had to take advantage of this amazing opportunity. I didn't even know who Segovia was. But I volunteered out of family duty and I said, okay, I'll do it. And I also thought this would get me out of having to con continue any more piano lessons. And the guitar seemed like a very exotic thing to, to be doing in those days. So I'm the one who inherited the guitar lessons and that's how it all began. And later on, uh, when we moved back to Minneapolis, which is where I grew up, that we spent a year in Italy, I became passionate about model rockets and science, my father being a scientist, but I was inspired by a rocket club at school and would spend hours building and launching them. And my father used to say, you, you can't launch your rockets till you put in an hour in the guitar. And that's how he bribed me to continue. So I was going to be a scientist. Music was not my thing, but it was fun. And then when I was 14, I entered a competition and the award as, a pri as the first prize winner was to be the soloist with the Minnesota Orchestra for 10,000 people. And the moment I walked out on stage, I thought this is even more exciting than sending my little worms and grasshoppers up into space. I think I'll become a guitarist. Were your parents musically inclined? My mother was, and there are a lot of musicians and painters and actors in her side of the family. My father really was the, the lone wolf in the science department. So he enjoyed learning all about music through my mother and through the family, and they were totally supportive. When you were, I assume you went to public school? I did. How did other people react to you playing a guitar? It was actually, I don't have too many memories of that in grade school, probably because I wasn't very good at that point yet. So I didn't really share it. When I got into junior high, and then people started to know and 
actually they called me Professor Isbin because in seventh grade I would run around giving lectures to all the science classes with my cloud chamber and my rockets. So I was really more more known in the, the science area than I was in, in the music. But eventually um, I was very lucky because in my last two years of high school, I had some fabulous teachers in philosophy and in English and uh, American history that uh, I was able to, in the last two years, do what they had been experimenting with at that time, which was modular scheduling. So I was able to rig up a system, uh, especially in my last year, where I could really spend only three hours in school and the rest of the time practicing. And that gave me the chance to do five hours a day, which was amazing in terms of just giving me the opportunity to get much better. After high school, you went to college? I went to Yale University. I, okay. I wanted to get a good education and I was an undergraduate there and then I stayed an extra year to get a master's degree. And by that time I was already performing uh, internationally during the summertime and during holidays. When you were at Yale, did you study music? I majored in music, but most of my classes were not in music. So I took uh, art history, philosophy, uh, literature, all kinds of things, uh, various languages. I studied French, German, and Spanish. So I, I uh, really had a pretty wide ranging uh, education there. And that comes in handy. I mean, you, you want to have something to say when you're a musician and, and it, it doesn't involve just putting your fingers on the strings it, it you have to, to be engaged by the world, be engaged with politics, with people, with thought processes, with science, with all kinds of things. In fact, you know, one of the hardest things for me right now is with the advent of the internet is I'm so distracted by all of the news that is uh, available 24 seven that for me, I'm always going down a rabbit hole and it's very easy to become immersed in just the process of learning all the time. I, I, I find it fascinating. Do you think that informs your musicianship? Absolutely. I've noticed that you, you've worked with probably every important modern composer. Is there a particular composer from the past that you particularly admire and enjoy playing? I, I've certainly, I spent 10 years studying with the great Bach scholar and keyboard artist, Rosalind Turek, and together we created the first performance editions of the Bach Lute Suites. And I recorded all of them and still available today. And I, I've also thrived on the idea of collaboration with other musicians who are also composers in different genres, whether it's Mark O'Connor and country fiddle or Steve Vai, rock guitar, or Nancy Wilson from the, the rock pop world. Uh, it's been very exciting to, and Joan Baez, of course, the, the folk music icon. It's been very exciting to have collaborations with amazing artists like that because it, it brings me to a whole another level of understanding and inspiration. And right now, I, I'm very proud to have just released last year two albums, one of which is called Affinity, and it's music all written for me from composers in three different continents. It opens with a work by Chris Brubeck, the son of the great composer and pianist Dave Brubeck, and even uses for its slow section, a beautiful ballad that Dave Brubeck wrote called Autumn. And this work is for guitar and orchestra. I perform it with the Maryland Symphony conducted by Elizabeth Schulz. Very exciting to have done because we did the world premiere and to, to then be able to, to go into the studio at the Strathmore Hall in Maryland and to be able to record this was a, a great honor. Other works on that album include music from Cuba by Leo Brower uh, that, that are based on African love stories collected by 19th century ethnologist from Germany and music uh, by the American Persian composer, Richard Daniel Poor, in which I'm joined by the mezzo-soprano, Isabel Leonard, a, a big star at the Met Opera, as well as other companies in the world. There's music by Antonio Lauro, uh, which includes a second guitar part fashioned by a former student of mine, Colin Davin, in the style of 
Venezuelan folk music. I was inspired by a memory I had some years back of playing in Venezuela and being at a party and playing this particular work by Lauro and all of a sudden hearing another guitar join me with wonderful folk idiomatic strums improvised and it turned out to be Lauro's daughter. So I hope in my mind that someday I would find a person who could write a second guitar part in that spirit and Colin did. So he joins me in the album for that work. There's also music from China by the composer Tan Dun. And this is inspired by Chinese folk music. Uh, he's, he survived the Cultural Revolution, a long story, but uh, after being banished to the rice fields to be a farmer, uh, he really explored all kinds of exotic sounds from stones and pans and drumming uh, and Chinese folk music. And when he finally did make it over to the United States, he was able to bring this rich heritage with him. And he's the composer of Crouch and Tiger, Hidden Dragon. A lot of people know him for that. So it's <clears throat> uh, Affinity was an exciting album to release last year, along with another by called Strings for Peace that represents a new collaboration that I have with the foremost Sarod players from India, Amjad Ali Khan and his sons, Aman and Ayan. This is music that was created by Amjad Ali Khan for us to play together. Uh, we had just done a tour in India in 2019, and it was so exciting. I said, we have to go into a studio and the one day you're in town in New York, let's do it. And that's how it happened. The title Strings for Peace was created long before we had any idea that the world would turn in a very dark way. Uh, that the pandemic would happen. This was created in 19, uh, 2019. So when it was released, it was very appropriate with all of the impetus behind it for healing and for peace and for community of spirit with different cultures. Uh, it's a work that has North Indian classical music in the form of ragas in combination with the guitar and the sarod, sarod being another plucked instrument that is a relative in some regards to the guitar in that it has strings, but they're metal strings. They use fingernails on the left hand, we use them on the right hand. They use a plectrum, we use our, our, our fingers to, to pluck the, the strings. Uh, I have frets, they don't. So there are a lot of different ways that these kinds of variations merge together and create something new and special. But is it a melding of the raga style and Western music? Is that it is. It's, it's taking Sarod and the ancient tradition of ragas and putting them together with the guitar and uh, in a way that is beautifully conceived by Amjad Ali Khan. Mm -hmm. we, we have a concert uh, next week in Florida. So if any of your listeners happen to be hanging out there, uh, come join us. You must travel an extraordinary amount. Your... Well, I certainly have, but there's, uh, you know, a big pedal was applied to that during the pandemic because it, it hasn't really been safe. Uh, the first sh live show in person that I did was in the summertime. It was actually Strings for Peace at the Caramore Festival here in New York. And then I performed at the Aspen Music Festival where I direct the guitar department there for many years and always lead a fabulous group of students from all over the world in master classes for a month. So it was one of the things that we can take away from this ghastly experience of the pandemic is a sense of appreciation and gratitude for what we do have. And I think nobody in my world will ever take for granted again the ability to play music and to share that with people. I'd never used a webcam before. I didn't even know what Zoom was. So all of this was a new experience and we just have to adapt to whatever the demands are. Uh, I very thrilled to be able in the Athens, Georgia concert to be joined by Jessica Rivera, a, a wonderful soprano who I first performed with in, in 2019 at the Aspen Music Festival. So we are uh, delighted to be able to reprise that in a series of concerts this year of which Aspen, uh, Athens will be the first. Can you talk a bit about the program that you're going to be doing? Yes, it includes music from Spain and South America. Uh, reflected by the Defaya songs, which originally were written for voice and piano, but adapt so well for the guitar because 
that's what inspired Faya in the first, first place to write them. And they're, they're folk inspired songs. We're, we're also doing music from Argentina by Golijov, a work called Lua Descolorida, which is translates to Colorless Moon. It's a very heartfelt, beautiful song. And we're doing a couple of movements from the Monsalvace, also a Spanish composer of, of his Cinco Canciones Negras, which I, I arranged for guitar and, and voice. Uh, the Villa Lobos famous aria from the Bacchianas Brasileras number five. This is Villa Lobos's own arrangement for voice and guitar, which he created in order for uh, Segovia's dear friend, uh, actually his mistress at that time, to be able to perform accompanying herself. She played the guitar and sang. The works that open the concert are by Richard Daniel Poor. This is um, featured on the uh, album I did that I mentioned earlier, Affinity. And they're called Songs of Love and Longing, dedicated to a departed dear friend of mine. And they're very exotic in their approach to the poetry, uses poetry of Rumi, ancient Persian poetry, and uh, very much in a, in a uh, a harmonic idiom that is very tonal, which is appropriate also for the expression of, of these songs. So they are beautiful and very colorful in the way the music describes the, the actual words. I do some solos by Granados uh, from Spain and as well from South America of Antonio Lauro and a Paraguayan composer, Agustin Barrios Mangore, and as well a work adapted for guitar from piano called Asturias, which again points out how the composer like Albanius, who didn't play the guitar and didn't compose for it, was very much inspired by the instrument. Did you and Ms. Rivera, when you met in 2019, say, by goodness, we got to do a tour together? How did that all come about? Well, it just turned out to be such a, a fruitful collaboration that she suggested the idea and it was actually very prescient because it, it makes sense during this time when things are scaled down to be able to present guitar and voice and the ability to do that in uh, concert halls right now, it, it makes it something that is a, a really much sought after commodity. We'll be competing the day before just to be there with the football game, but uh, that should be over by Sunday, unless they but, go into long, long uh, overtimes. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> There's also been a documentary about you where I think they do a really nice job of showing you collaborating with composers in the development of the compositions that they're working on. I think that's one of the exciting features of the documentary because you get to be a fly on the wall as we engage with each other and discover things together. And that's the point behind the scenes you never see when you see a finished product presented either in a recording or on stage. So I think people, even if they have no musical inclination, find that fascinating. And some of the composers I work with in that documentary who've written for me are John Coriano, uh, Tan Dunn, Christopher Rouse, Steve Vai, I, I bet you remember more than I, than I do, uh, Joan Baez. So it is uh, a very, and Mark O'Connor, of course, it's a very special opportunity to see the, the, the living being of collaboration and of music making. I assume they're not all, how could they be expert in writing for the guitar? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I assume they're drawing on your knowledge and your skill. My blood, sweat and tears. Yes. Yes. But, you know, it's a different experience for each composer. For Tan Dunn, I hardly had to change a note. He really did his research, knew what he was doing and was inspired by the ancient Chinese lute or pipa. And I had to become a pipa player. So in that regard, I did have to stretch my horizons and rise to the occasion with a different kind of technical uh, transformation to make that happen. Um, and the greatest, one of the great compliments he paid me was he said, my God, you sound like a pipa player. So that, that was really fun to hear. 
Uh, Chris Rouse also did his homework, but we worked in a special kind of way where every time he'd write a page, he'd send it to me and I would review it and let him know if there were any things that, that had to be changed. So that, that gave him guidance uh, in the future. Most of the kinds of changes I had to make were revoicing. In the case of John Coriano, he was actually terrified of the guitar and kept postponing the process of, of starting the piece, even though I gave him scores to study recording, even a manual, uh, a mock guitar fingerboard out of cardboard. And then I lent him a guitar, which he put under the piano and then hid in the closet because it, it scared him to look at. <laughs> and the only reason that piece ever came to happen was that he received a phone call from a fellow in Canada who was eager to have John coach him on an opera he was composing. And in the course of their phone conversation, John learned that he was a guitarist and he said, all right, you come live in my guest house for a month, be at my beck and call as I write this guitar concerto, and I will help you with your opera. Because by that time, I had already left for the summer and there was nothing more I could do. So bless his heart, when I came back a month later, the piece was done and I hardly had to change a note. So each, each experience is different. And again, I assume your conversations with the composers help inform your interpretation of the music. Of, of course, and I always coach with them. I, I, if I have to ask about phrasing or colors, uh, different kinds of revoicings, I say, what do you like better, this or this, or this or this, and they'll have an opinion. And sometimes uh, it's what I guessed it would be, and sometimes it's different. So it's so fortunate to be able to work with living composers in that capacity. Do you, do you listen to music yourself? I, I do when I have time. Absolutely. Yes. And do you have a particular favorite that you listen to? Really all kinds of genres. And I, 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 I couldn't even begin to list them. Um, as diverse as uh, Lorena McKennett from Canada uh, to Rubinstein playing Chopin, Rosalind Turek playing Bach, Alicia Rocha playing Spanish music on the keyboard. Uh, now with the internet access, it's, possible in a few seconds to to see anything and everything and hear it. So I feel very fortunate for that. I know you have to go. And hey, I really appreciate it, it was great talking with you. Thank you. It was fab and fabulous to talk to you. Thank you so much. <laughs>